Don't you know that from coast to coast where there's dope, there's hope, where there's dope, there's hope. Shh, wait. Is it lit? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cats and dogs, welcome to the Herbal Tea Lounge, an interview series with your boys, Earth Tone. And your man, the real PZ, you already. And we got a very, very, very special guest for you guys. Um, this is our debut interview. Uh, and, you know, we decided to do this series because a lot of people have been asking about it, but we wanted to make sure we sat down with somebody we're speaking to and this is definitely somebody who you guys are going to enjoy i'm gonna let my man peasy bring him in and introduce our very special guest for the day yes sir today we're featuring the illustrious james felton keith the second hey aka jfk engineer and serial entrepreneur with the platform known as inclusionism I met him during Pride last year, but I've been hearing about this man's name since 2017. Believe it or not, who would? Yes, absolutely. Ringing, ringing bells. Ringing bells out <laughs> here in these streets. You already know. Um, who would have thought that we would do a complete 180? And mm. this is where we are right now, a year later. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, thanks for joining us. Now, la last year you launched your campaign for the House of Representatives seat of the 13th Congressional District of New York, currently held by Adriano Espaillat. Talk to us about the status of your campaign and what's next. Oh, man. Uh, well, the campaign was going pretty smoothly up until February. I got, I got really sick and sort of went out of commission for a good five weeks. And then... I'm still about 90, 90, 95%. I think about the five weeks after that, I was in a pretty bad place and lost a few people, some campaigners, uh, some family members were sick. My mother was hospitalized. We lost a few people in the building. And it just seemed like, you know, COVID-19 made me sort of reassess life and what was important. And while I felt like, you know, I was letting down a, a lot of people by not, you know, running strong into the finish line. We just recently suspended the, the campaign last week. Uh, that said, we did make the ballot. So I think people are still gonna go out and vote for us on, uh, on June 23rd, uh, which is the, the state primary. It also includes the presidential primary. Um, but, you know, we, we can't control what, what's going on always in the world. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to living to, to fight another day. So the campaign is funny enough growing. A lot more people are coming to the website and volunteering. But the thing is, this is really the time where people figure out who candidates are through March and May, and then mm -hmm. in June, and then we vote. At least that's how we do it in New York, mm -hmm. right? So we thought we'd get a lot more fanfare. You know, I had two interviews coming up with, you know, on the regular news, you know, and everyone's like, what are you going to tell them? I was like, well, I'm going to tell them, you know, what the fight is right now, you know, and the fight is around economic inclusion. It's around, you know, all of these murders that have been going on around the country. Uh, they just murdered another guy in Louisville, Kentucky during a protest. Uh, we are not talking about, about that. that. Yeah. I just heard about that, actually. Right. So, you know, so the, the campaign uh team is growing but no we have we suspended the campaign for 2020 we're looking forward to 2022 and but more importantly i'm looking forward to sort of the things that we expect to get changed uh, i've been arguably the the number one you know lobbyist from a, a data and cyber standpoint on the planet and we plan to still change a lot of laws with a lot of the new political capital that we have um, just, you know, being in this race and being in the game. So, you know, we're going to take a breather, check on the family. We got a march coming up here in Harlem tomorrow uh, for George Floyd's funeral. Super and, facts. Yeah, so, you know, we, we got stuff going on for sure. But, um, you know, we won't I'll be on the ground campaigning like we were at the beginning of the year yeah. over the course of the next three weeks. And so I, 
I'm a little embarrassed by you. I'm, I regret to say it. You know, I don't even know how to answer your question. I'm like, well, you know. You know, and, I don't. I don't think you should be embarrassed. I think you <laughs> mobilized me to actually see what's going on. Hmm. Uh, government-wise, at least locally in the state and, you know, definitely federally. So I just applaud you and I thank you for right. just um, opening doors because you would have been or you are uh, one of the first LGBT POCs who, you know, would have been able to get that seat. And I think just yeah. you you running is definitely a big step for us. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's definitely to be commended. And I thank you so much for just embracing all this energy that's around you and, you know, opening that platform. Yeah. So, let's, um, not, let's not skate over the corona. Like, COVID <laughs> is no joke. Like, it's the it real really is. Like, that shit is out and here killing people. So for you to true. have, you know, survived it, gone through the loss of people who have some come to it it's 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 not easy and then to still be yeah. able to pick up the pieces and get back out there and figure it out and keep moving forward we definitely yeah. commend that we need more of it i mean we we're, we're getting hit from every angle right now and it's not easy Absolutely. it's never been easy but i don't believe i've ever seen it like this and it always makes me think about like the youth like we're used to it. We've seen this before in some way, shape, or form, but it's kids out there who are just coming of age, coming in mm -hmm. 18, 19 years old, figuring out who they are, and they're yep. seeing this, and there's no escaping it. The internet is everywhere. Social media is everywhere. You have to see this, so it's going to be very interesting to see how we come up out of this, being that everybody feels it. Everybody has to see it. Everybody has to deal with it in some way, shape, or form, so hopefully, Absolutely. man, you know, it's going to lead to to better days but we commend yeah. you for being out here and being in the forefront i mean a lot of people out here who haven't experienced covid are, are scared to get out there and, and go march so for you to be you know a part of something like that is is a big big they did it's a me, big deal they did tell me no i, I appreciate it they did tell me so I, I had another test and then i had the antibodies test so i came up negative as of last week Mm. And my antibodies came back showing I do have antibodies. And so, you know, apparently I was fighting it internally. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't catch it again. Mm. We don't know. But, you know, things are just so dire. We got to mm. do something. And yeah. actually, to y'all's point, I was on a conference call, you know, back when everything was running smoothly with a dance company. And they had a bunch of different dancers there. But one of them was 15 years old. Mm. And she was just like, Where's the world going? Like, is this it? Is it over? I just got here. And I just, I can't even imagine. When I was 15, everything was, you know, I was 15 and 95 and everything was cool. I was just worried about if I was going to get a car that year, uh, you know. And, then even it. It, and even if it wasn't, you ain't have a phone yeah. telling you like, oh, this is what's going oh, yeah, on. Da, da, da. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. We yeah. need to have a beeper because our neighbors would tell <laughs> my mother that we were drug dealers if we had one. We actually, actually, I did have one, and I would just put a battery in the tail. Wasn't as a, it wasn't activated. Yeah, yeah it wasn't activated. Yeah. Not. Uh, wow, wow. <laughs> that was back then. But, but the other thing that was in that meeting was, you know, there was a bunch of there were a bunch of guys, young guys, gay and bi guys who uh, who danced with like Harlem Dance Company and Elisa Monte uh, Dance Company, and they introduced me to all these uh, artists who are really leading this march tomorrow. So mm. these are folks who uh, I would say aren't in the political class, if that's a phrase. So the political mm. class of people uh, in politics, we call them triple primes. They always vote, we have data on them, we know where they live, how they live, how to contact them. But the, the largest voting class are people who don't vote at all. And mm. so these guys, you know, they make suits for like famous people, D.L. Hewley and Prince and all these folks. And they live right here in the neighborhood and they reached out like, we want to have a march of 100 men in suits. I was like, we can do better than 100. Mm. Just let us tell some politicians about it and some other folks. I was like, but we won't, you know, hijack your movement. Uh, and they were like, well, yeah, we don't mind people speaking. I was like, no, really, we want to follow you. I mean, I'm, I'm going to come say something because we <laughs> linked up with them. Yeah. But we want to follow them because we want that group to stay engaged. Like, these are the, the cool people from Instagram and their pictures look great. And when they talk about politics, a new group of folks are listening mm -hmm. than you know, those of us who are already involved. 
So it is like, you know, PZ and company, it's, it's just, it's the cool kids who are like, I want to play now. And when I talk to any of them, I just try to tell folks, look, this is about power. And if you ever thought about power and being powerful, this is raw power. Like you can mm-hmm. wave a wand or wave a pen and change the way the world works. Mm. And if that ain't grand, I don't know what it is. So I think that's really, that's the work is telling people, yeah, you're supposed to be this powerful, you know? Yeah. yeah. Supposed to be in play. And they starting to take it, you know? And these protests are adding to that because that's a new group that we get to now try to target and communicate to. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really, as dire as it is, I'm excited about that. You know, and, and if I die walking from 125th Street to 96, but, you know, 20 new cats are out here participating, you know, I'm exhausted. So. Yeah. 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 You know I'm going to hold you down. You already know 10 toes. So it is so what it run is. Back. When I drop it, you're you going to come right back up. <laughs> Fuck the bullshit. We're going to make all the tribute songs, all the videos. Get you it know, in. You know what I'm saying? Get it in. We're that, just yeah. doing <laughs> white tees, all of that shit. Be immortalized. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you would be immortal. Um, all right. So here we go. We're, we're talking about your campaign, and you've done so much to create Get the momentum, at least in my eyes. What can we really do um, to keep that momentum going? Like, you already know I'm there 2022. I'm there 2024. I'm there yeah. 2030, whatever. Yeah. So, but everybody else coming up behind, and we want to make sure that this, this message that you're putting now continues to reverberate, not just now because election year but it keeps going and that's my real big thing. So what could we do to continue uh, the work that you started to continue the momentum that you've already uh, began? I think it comes back to, this is gonna sound cliche, but I'll, I'll get into the details of how we actually do it. We just gotta continue to organize, right? So at my core, I consider myself a process engineer. So I, I'm an organizer by training. Process engineers, they just sort of look at the world in boxes and vectors and say, what fits where? So I usually just come in and try to organize organizers. If there's somebody with a passion for something, I say, well, here's how you make it better. Here's how you make it an institution, right? Like I did a march, and I think a good example is this. I was interacting with a bunch of universal basic income activists who had their biannual conference, like a continental conference. It's called the North American Basic Income Guarantee uh, Conference. And they met right here in Harlem, in East Harlem, at the Silverman School, which is a CUNY uh, university, um, right over on 2nd, right, and like 118th Street. And it was all these activists, you know, they're nerding out about basic income and why we should have it, why we deserve it, why we're owed it. But I just tried to appeal to them and say, look, we should march. And they're like, well, what is a march going to do? Marches don't do anything. And these are Mm. comfortable people. These ain't the streets per se, but they care about folks in the street. But I, I got introduced to them by some homeless activists who were previously homeless and now, you know, do different jobs. And I was like, look, if we march, it's spiritual. It's about, like, you can feel the people, you come together. And so I convinced them to do a march last October. And we did it right up here on 145th and marched from Harlem over into the Bronx, the two poorest neighborhoods in New York City, um, with, you know, Central Brooklyn not far behind and Jamaica Queens not far behind that. But anyway, you know, everywhere the black people live. But the deal is, uh, after that, a whole organization proliferated called the Income Movement. They have 60,000 members now. They're raising money a lot. And my work is really just about, if I can find people with passions that I can convince to create an institution and we're in a good place. Because I think too often, what our people do, whether they're, you know, creative or have a business mind or some sort of skill set is, they don't look at themselves as having the potential of building a big institution, but they totally can. Yeah. So again, it's just, that's my skill set though, right? Is I'm, I'm just an engineer, you know, I went to B school. And so my, my formal training is very much so around how would you engineer a company to exist? Mm. So I just meet people who I think would make great companies and I try to build a box around them that other people can, can pour into. And so when I say the way we keep it going is we have to keep organizing. We, we, we will do exactly that. Like we're going to do this March tomorrow. We're going to do more stuff in the income space. We're going to do more stuff in the housing and healthcare space. We're going to do more stuff, again, in the LGBT space. Like I just joined the board of World Pride 
and they didn't have anything black on the agenda. But to their credit, they said, well, the reason we wanted you to come in, World Pride is in Denmark, in Copenhagen next year. And right. they were like, you know, we know what we don't have, and we need you to tell us. Mm -hmm. So we brought a coalition of people. We built a black lesbian conference that's going to be happening there. So you have like African lesbians, and, you know, black oh, American wow. lesbians, you name it. I'm not I a big fan. Yeah, African American. I just do black, but whatever people mm -hmm. like, it'll be there. So we'll have like the black lesbian faction, the black trans faction, the black, you know, men's faction. We'll we'll invite uh, a guy who runs a conference here called uh, the Press Gay Black Men, which is a big conference in the healthcare space. But mm -hmm. they'll do it at World Pride now. So we'll be on that stage. Uh, and again, it's just about organizing. We took a lot of the organizers here and said, look. Do you want to be on the international stage where everybody is thinking about how you do your stuff? And it's not just the, the white people in Copenhagen. It's, you know, the people in the Middle East and the people in Asia and the people in South America who don't have anywhere close to the rights that we have mm -hmm. as hard as they are. So, so that's just the work. And so, we, you know, we're going to do that. That's, yeah. you know, every now and again, we'll take a hit. I'll crawl up under the bed and cry about it. And then in two days, I come back out and, you know, we act like nothing is wrong. I still got a whole lot of that sort of toxic masculinity going on. Mm, I'll bottle mm. stuff up and get work done. You got to you know, har harness it, you know. It's like any yeah, other power tool, it. you know. You got to use it the yeah. right way or, right, or it'll it's, bite it's, you in the ass. <laughs> right. I'm getting back. I'm trying to get good with that now, right? Yeah. Like, you going to go, maybe you're a little depressed maybe you're a little sad maybe you're a little tired we maybe we all have to be at this point it has to be some kind of ps psd or PTSD some ptsd we all we, we, we all been going through it all of it ha all of us have it yeah like, absolutely we all that's, have it, it that's a part it of not Just, being able to escape it but with with that being period. said you mentioned your skill set would yeah. you consider running for president and if you would what would be the focus of your campaign? Uh, I hadn't I haven't considered anything like that, but you know, I get all right. We plan all right. We plan what yeah, I did. Yeah, fine. yeah. If I ran for president, uh, look, I think the role of a politician is not just, especially if you're the executive. So if you're president or governor or mayor, right? That's different than being a legislator, mm -hmm. right? So I think. First things first, it's necessary to recognize that politics is about power, not policy. Policy is a secondary thing. And a lot of times you can judge the character of people you're dealing with by the policies that they advocate for. But politics mm -hmm. is about power mm -hmm. first. And when you're the executive, different from being in the legislature of any sort, whether you're a U.S. senator or state senator or U.S. congressman or state assembly member or state rep uh, or city council member, the role is really as sort of a moral leader. So the, the role is really about reconciliation. And I think the biggest opportunity we have in a country like this, or even on a global stage, is to reconcile what harms done to people, not only economically, but socially, politically, technologically. But I think the way you make a peace offering, if you're gonna reconcile, is it has to be with something tangible. So the first thing I would be advocating for is a guaranteed equity stake hmm. and that's different than just a standard income it's different than just like a standard check but i would first be advocating for everyone having an ownership stake in america so if you live here and you make our neighborhoods different for whatever reason you're a homeless guy that sleeps on the subway or you're the executive that lives in a high rise whatever it is you make the character of our neighborhood what it is if, if a comedian comes out and tells jokes about harlem you know they got executive jokes and they got hmm. homeless people jokes and all of them might be offensive, but all of them are probably funny to somebody. Mm -hmm. And those people's <laughs> input of their culture, their essence, their being in that place makes them valuable. In fact, they have an intrinsic value. Mm. So the first thing I would do, like the lead off of, if I had a platform, <laughs> if I was running for president, it would, it would be very specific to guaranteeing people's income and, and noting, trying to convince them that they have some valuable input to society and that they're owed a payback from that. that so would be if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's similar to like looking at America pretty much as a, a company, a business, you're the CEO and you're giving the citizens stock in their, in their company. 
Right, exactly. That's exactly what I got from it. I think it's sort of like it's sort of like a dance between a church and a company. So mm. what well, well, we want people to believe, and they should. I think people should believe in people. I don't believe we are the blind or blind or leading blind people. Yeah. You know, I I believe in people. Like I'm I'm down to do the podcasts and the marches, et cetera. Cause I like people. I like I like how they look. I like how they sweat. I like how they smell. Even when it ain't great, I can sense them. I know them. I know that they're there. So yeah. half of the job is saying, in this trust, in this church that we have called America, called New York, called whatever, you are valuable. It's like when a preacher says you have favor. But when I say you have favor to go to the corporate side, I'll say, I can prove it to you on a spreadsheet. Like mm. I can show you that favor and I can make it a number and I can put it in your bank account and I can make sure that you can live a dignified life because you're a part of our church. You're mm. part of us. You're part of our corporation. And so what I'm saying is as you are a member, a citizen, uh, uh, a provider of input to our collective value, you should be able to live a dignified life uh, via the healthcare you receive, the housing you have, and being able to go out and buy stuff that you need and not just basic goods, right? I'm not just talking about saran wrap and toilet paper. You know, if, you know, y'all might buy different stuff, you know, yeah, somebody might have a kid, you'd be like, I want to buy a crazy birthday cake because that's mm. how I get down for my kids. Yeah. You should be able to do that. So I think uh, the platform will look very much so like, well, like inclusionism. Right. So my, my core philosophy is really just based on three principles. The idea that people have an intrinsic value first, that they have that they only derive that value from each other. Second, which I think is a bit controversial mm. uh, to some folks, at least. And thirdly, that they're entitled to or owed some equity in the value that comes from those interactions. And to be clear, it's not an attack on any old religions or anything. It's really just. It's a, it's a physics analogy. So as an engineer, I don't like anything that doesn't have a good physics analogy. Because if it doesn't, that means it probably doesn't exist. Mm. Right? So when I say you have intrinsic value, I mean, I can show you that, again, on a spreadsheet. You know, as you all bounce up against each other, you all are arguably different people after doing a podcast together. Just because mm. of whatever works or whatever you're picking up from each other. But we could see that transaction in data if we wanted to. Yeah. That's number one. So the value is evident. It is intrinsic. And I can prove it because we have data now. That's number one. Number two, when I say we derive, only derive our value from each other, I mean, we are the ones who say that the other people exist and therefore are good and have an intrinsic value. If we existed in an empty white space with no friction, then nothing would happen in that space and no energy would proliferate. Mm -hmm. So for the second principle, I'm really saying Value is like that of energy. It cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change form. Most people learn that in the third grade about energy. So if you take, if you take uh, particles and you move them, they have friction. And from that friction, energy proliferates. Mm -hmm. And everything moves on energy. Energy is a real thing. It's a tangible thing. It's not a you know, fictional, ideological, abstract thing. Now, if we move to value, data is just like those particles. And the transaction of it, it's just like that friction. And so when that happens, value proliferates almost inherently, just like energy does. Mm. So I'm saying it is a fact that you all only have your value because you exist here together. And then third, the most significant political piece, I think, is that you're entitled to some equity on that value that proliferates or some energy that proliferates from that fr friction. If the two of you are making friction in a podcast or whatever, but one person is taking all the value from it, it's a problem. Now that doesn't mean that in some situations, you know, like if you look at some of these companies, I'm never saying that the boss isn't worth twice as much as the employees, but you're not worth 500 times as much. Mm. You're not worth 253 times as much, which is yeah. what the CEO of General Motors is worth for her employees. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. You can be super rich and make decisions about your company or about your institution with 10 times as much value as people. Yeah. You know, you still be able to get places faster because you're a more critical person to be in certain situations. We get that. We get that. But there is a point where it's excessive. Yeah, and we've gotten to the point in humanity where we forgot that the only reason that we are good is because everybody else is pouring in us. 
mm. you know. So that would be the platform. It would be about, you know, radical inclusion, heavy handed inclusion. That's that's the next thing. I'm, I'm actually I'm I'm writing my next book on that. So my next book is, is called Inclusionism. But I've been, uh, you know, be, because, of, excuse me, coronavirus and, you know, the protests, I've just been I've been depleted, man. Yeah. Can't imagine. My, I owed my uh, my publisher a book on the first two days ago and oh. they're like what's up and i was like all right i don't know like I'll, i'm gonna let you know well, where I, you at with it how far uh, in are you or did you start or where you at yeah no so i mean so inclusionism is a framework my radio show is about it you know it's just a, a matter of just putting it you know, packaging yeah, it. it's some work it's some yeah. hours to to write through how that book is gonna go tell you the truth though i was talking to um um uh, a musician that I met at Afropunk years ago before it was like a cool thing. This must have been like 2011. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hit him up. His name is Sin Kane with a K S I N K A N E. And I was like, yo, I would love to drop an EP of inclusionism. Not mm-hmm. like, it won't, I'm not musical per se, but if I'm talking about these principles over tracks, I was like, you know, if we dropped a 10 track EP, and everything was less than five minutes. I think people could digest that better than a book. You know, we'll write the book, but I'm not one of those people who's like, you know, in my head about, you know, how many words can I write around people? I, I used to spend a lot of time at the philosophy school at University of Utah, Michigan State, and some other places. And I would never forget what I used to think when people would come to talk to some authors that will come to the university to speak to them. And they would always apologize if they didn't understand. So if you have a question, you didn't understand the passage of the book, you first say, you know how, I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask about blah, blah, blah. It should be the other way around. If I'm writing, you should dig it. And if you don't, I'm probably not writing it well. If we write this stuff, we're talking about stuff and it's not hip hop, if it don't make sense, yeah, it's, it's obtuse, it's pompous, you know? And and sign me up for that EP. Sign yeah. me up. That sounds we need crazy. To work on that. <laughs> but that's 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 interesting. You bring that up because I was thinking about like you know the structure of the government and a lot of things have been in place for a very long time, like generations. And we look at you know the way technology progresses, iPhones, computers. We get updates every month. It seems like. Yeah. What is it? that's in place and what department is responsible for doing that for the government? Like who's updating these policies, who's taking in the information and being like, okay, this is outdated. We need to adjust this. We need to change this. Like what, what, what is that? I what mean, does that, that look like? Or does it even exist? Yeah, no. It, well, that responsibility is really on the elected officials. Mm-hmm. So they really have to do two jobs. They have to run and be likable or popular enough, which is more, it feels more like marketing uh, to get elected. Right, so they have to run and get elected. But then after they're elected, hopefully the reason they're being elected is because their people from their area believe that they have the potential to change a lot. Right, so you, so like for instance, when Bernie Sanders ran, and then you know he lost in 2016, but we won a lot of progressive seats in 2018. A lot of people were going to Congress with the charge of establishing health care for all and a green new deal and things like that. So they were updated mm. policies. Mm. Um, the problem is there's usually a tug of war between conservatives who don't want anything to change. I'm not trashing them. Mm-hmm. I should say real quick, you know, conservatism inherently means you are protectionist or want to protect what exists and you don't want to change anything because, because you're comfortable. Right, and you think the world should try to get to your level of comfort or do whatever it is you do to, to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a ridiculous <laughs> claim, but it is also a check on our ability to, you know, run radically into the future without questioning ourselves. But at this point, conservatism has run amok. So there are people on both sides of the aisle, uh, and then some people in the middle even who disagree about what should be updated. So every update to how the government works is really a war of power mm. and that's why we we have to participate really i mean uh, yeah so so it's their responsibility to do that and then you have governmental departments that that uh are controlled by the executive branch by the president so 
let's say a law fails to change over time, a president could come and make an executive order and they could go to, you know, any department, pick any department you like, whether it be, you know, the Department of Defense or the Department of Education. Uh, and they could just Housing change. and urban development. Totally, right? So they could go and say, I want to put a bunch of money in the night, right? Because it's necessary. Mm. Not that this president would do that, right? But they would have that ability to control those budgets. And now Congress, if Congress disagreed, you know, people like the office that I'm running for, then they could step in and say, you know, we're going to make it illegal for you mm. to spend it that way. So there's always sort of a war of contracts between what the legislative body can do and what the executive branch can do. Um, but they both have the potential to do workarounds on the other. The mm. thing is, it's a lot easier for the executive than it is for the legislative body because the legislative body has to basically make a proposal of a change from a single person, a single elected official, and then it gets buy-in from more elected officials, and then it goes to, uh, to the floor and is judged by everyone else. Mm. So sometimes... You know, you might be the guy with the, the best idea in the room, but it might be best strategy to give it to somebody else and let them bring it forward because people don't like you. Or you don't have enough power to persuade well, right. enough You don't have people. enough power, yeah. you're new, or people think, you know, you, you're consuming too much power too fast. It's just like, I would look at politics like, uh, like an elementary school playground. You know, mm. and usually the kids who run the playground they probably going to become good executives or good uh, politicians. Uh, there's a little bit of crazy, a little bit of sociopathy involved there. Uh, but I would look at it like that. You got people on both sides of the playground, some who like each other, some who don't. And sometimes people will say no, just because that girl they didn't like proposed the change. And they're like, screw her, we should beat her up. And then they do, they beat her up. And you know, when I was on the playground, we had those gravel playgrounds. So you know, mm. you will come back looking, you know, looking a rocky little, face. like you dragged, right. you got dragged. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, it really is like that. It's a bunch of people in there. You know, these people are not pals. They come from different neighborhoods. You know, someone was talking to me about AOC the other week and I like AOC, you know, I like her enough. And he was like, yeah, you want to go to Congress and do this and that with AOC? I was like, you know, I'm from Harlem. She's from Queens. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, here come the shade here it come you feel it coming on you feel it because i do yeah. all right like, all that's good. cute that's cool you know thousand people that i interact with just in this neighborhood alone so it's hard to be like i'm gonna go be cool up there just like whatever she's doing if we can collaborate sweet yeah but i'm really you know. just checking for the people in harlem the heights inwood king's bridge marble hill Cause that's all I can. Right, you gotta start at home. Yeah, you gotta you yeah. gotta start at home. All right, all right, we got about five minutes left. PZ, what you got? You got another question? Um, I actually do have another question. I was actually gonna just really piggyback off of the uh the the march you're gonna do mm. for George Floyd. Yeah. Um, and with the uprising being at such a fever pitch. Yeah. Now, um, what do you hope we can really accomplish uh, in the wake of all these protests and, and, and all of this uh, fervor that's, that's happening out here? A few things. I think what we're going to talk about at the march tomorrow is, and what we hope that other marchers will talk about across the country, is adding more transparency to policing, number one. So we want to repeal state laws like 50A here in New York. Uh, that's number one. Then we want to add new laws that make it really illegal for uh, cops to ignore claims of distress from detained people, right? Mm. So if you, if you say you can't breathe and the cop isn't calling EMS, it's a problem, you know? So we have a series of laws called the Andrew Kearse Act that at least I'm proposing and a bunch of other people are proposing to change that. But more broadly than those policy changes, I hope it's a real wake up moment. Like when I look outside, I see people, they don't always know what to do. I've got a lot of texts and emails from Asian people and white people and you name it. And they're like, how do I help? And so everyone seeing George Floyd be murdered the way he was has 
has been up in arms. And so I think the real next step that we have outside of some policy changes that we absolutely need uh, will be a time where we start to recognize our original sin, which is sort of ingrained, designed in, entrenched racism. Uh, one other thing that I think is cool that will get accomplished is I think a lot of the Confederate statues will start to come down because they think they're going to mm. be vandalized. And I think mayors will use it as an excuse not to put them back up. And we saw some of that happen in Virginia. I don't know if you all saw that. Yeah. So yeah. I think really those three things, right? It's new policies. It's an overall consensus from Americans that uh, the racist folks in charge have been corrupt. And last, that our places, our communities start to look different. You know, wow. this has given us the opportunity to say when we cry racism, we're not just, you know, crying wolf. Yeah. And, and, and now we expect something to be done about it. And, and people are being held accountable for it. So I think it's good. I think it would be a problem if we rush to heal too fast. And I was talking about that earlier this morning with a bunch of people. You know, we're in the middle of a surgery right now. We got open wounds. We want to put the bone in place. Wow. Clear the cancer. We have to do that first before we point. go into healing. You know, we don't need to rush point. to do that. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm not, I'm not ready to heal just yet. I'm not gonna burn nothing down either. Not. Yeah. Not up here, not above 96th Street, <laughs> but um, and we not having it like we gonna let folks know what's what. Yeah. But we are gonna be out in the streets, you know, and we're gonna be out in the streets, and our our precinct captains are gonna be out there uh, with us because I hit them up like you need to come see this, you know. There you have it, the Herbal Tea Lounge. Oh man, thank you to our special guest, Mr. JFK. If you didn't know for joining us on the initial, the first episode of the Herbal Tea Lounge. It most certainly won't be the last. It's your man, Earth Tone. And your man, the real peasy. Um, is there anything you want to tell the people before we get up out of here? Uh, sure. I would say, uh, so we're, we're starting this Keith Institute to carry all the work forward, uh, whether it be from an economic standpoint, a political standpoint, a social or technological uh, standpoint. So I would just uh, ask everyone, if they want to know more, go to jamesfeltonkeith.com or go to keithinstitute.com. It'll all take you to the same place. And, um, you know, link up with us there. We, we'll be doing a lot, not only here locally, but we'll be doing uh, some interesting things in the EU and Asia uh, in the coming months. Sounds so good. Sounds good. Well, there you have it. You got the information. Go check that out. Let your voice be heard. Positive actions out there. Everybody be safe. Be smart. Yes. You know what I mean? PZ, you got anything for the people? Hashtag we owe us. Hashtag right. we owe right. us. That's what it is. We most certainly do. We most certainly do. Yeah. And we and appreciate y'all joining us, you. man. Happy Pride. Go out there. Right. Celebrate. Right. Show, your, show your colors. Wave that flag. Yeah. You know what I mean? In the marches. Throw it, throw it in there. Yeah, All absolutely. That. Absolutely. And appreciate y'all tuning in, man. Again, this is the Herbal Tea Podcast with your boy Ertone and Peasy. Shout out to you, JFK. And everybody be safe out there, man. Thank you for tuning in. Peace. Oh, left from coast to coast. What is dope? This hope. What is dope? This hope. Sheesh. Wait. Is it lit?